1488, where he planted a wooden cross on a small island now called St. Croix or Santa Cruz. He gave the bay the name, the meaning Bay of the Rock, which was changed in Port Portugal to Baia de Lagoa, or Bay of the Lagoon, and which eventually became Algoa Bay. So Joshua Slocum talks about Algoa Bay in his book, Sailing Alone Around the World. And I quote, the early Portuguese navigators, endowed with patience, were more than 69 years struggling to round this cape, that's the Cape of Storms, before they got as far as Algoa Bay. And, and there in Algoa Bay, the crew mutinied. They landed on a small island now called Santa Cruz, where they devotedly set up a cross and swore they would cut the captain's throat if he attempted to sail any further. So the cross and the knife. Beyond this, they thought, was the edge of the world, which they too believed was flat. And fearing that their ship would sail over the brink of it, they compelled Captain Dias, their commander, to retrace his course, all being only too glad to get home. Earlier this week, I came across a baby seal on a deserted stretch of beach in Cape Recife, which is part of Algoa Bay. And this little seal was basking in the early morning sun, twisting its little furry head uh, from side to side, discovering a new scent. You know, perhaps I was the first human being it had ever seen. Unlike Dias and his sailors, its beautiful little liquid brown eyes were unafraid. It knew the world was not flat, no swimming over the edge. It was simply enjoying being alive and happy to rest for a little while. We all have a beginning, friends, don't we? Our starting point in life our first breath, which indicated we were alive. Moms and dads remember it well. We don't remember it so well. There were nurses around that helped us as we cried our way into this world. We breathed life. Genesis 1 explains the first beginning, the primal beginning of life on earth. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. And there was darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of the God was hovering over the waters. Without form, empty, dark were the heavens and the earth. Before God spoke. Before the voice of God spoke. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated light from darkness. God called the light day. In the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning. The first day. When God speaks, life happens. Glorious, wonderful life. When God speaks, the light increases and darkness recedes. The light that the stars of Captain Deus and his men used to navigate in the 15th century was spoken into existence by a powerful, loving God. The morning sun on the little Cape Fur Seal, which I saw earlier this week, enjoying the 21st century, was spoken into existence, a new day, by a holy, loving God. Hebrews 11, chapter 1, confirms this critically important truth, friends, the origins of life, the origins of your life and mine. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, verse 3, we understand, here it is, friends, that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. If the ancients were commended for this, friends, if those who have gone before us were commended for believing by faith, then so will we be. And so what are the consequences if we choose not to believe this? What are the consequences if we choose to believe as the ancients did? We will understand or misunderstand two of the critical elements of your life and mine. That great question, what's the purpose of life? That great question we often ask, what's the purpose of life? So going back a couple of thousand years to the beginning of worship, Genesis 4. Now Abel, you remember him? Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Genesis 4. 
Verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions of, from, of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Two men, two offerings, same family, different outcome. The one understood the purpose of life, the other didn't. Hebrews 11 tells us why. By faith, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Cain never understood the purpose of life. He made the mistake of thinking that his fresh produce he gathered each day as he went out on his farm was the product of of his clever scientific research and knowledge. He had no need to trust God, who caused those crops to grow. No need to come to God in faith. Abel, on the other hand, understood deep down in his being, in his gut, that none of those Marinos or those Aberdeen Angus or those Dorpers, not, not those Dorpers, eh? the Dorpers is a cat mensa, were ever his. They belonged to God. Abel knew what the purpose of life was to be a good steward of the gifts God had given him. He knew that every sheep, every cattle, every goat, everything he had was a gift of God. The consequences, friends, were and they still are huge today. Abel's life still speaks of a living, loving, joyful relationship with the holy God. The life of faith. By faith, he came with his offering. Cain came with no faith at all. And uh, verse 4, so Cain, or chapter 4, Genesis 4, so Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Well, we know what the outcome was of that downcast face, wasn't it? You know, um, fueled by jealousy, it festered into self-righteous aggression, and he took hold of his brother. Now, the Cape Fur Seal belongs to the eared seal family, and they're a subspecies of the Afro-Australian fur seal. I never knew that. Why Afro-Australian? Subspecies are generally similar species that are separated geographically, so they live in different parts of the world, or ecologically, same area, different prey or habitat preferences. The Cape fur seal and Australian fur seal are almost identical in appearance, but are classified as subspecies because of their different geographical ranges. That cannot be correct. How can the African fur seal be the same as the Australian fur seal? The African fur seal is simply superior in my book. <laughs> friendly rivalry, friendly rivalry is good, but there's no place for jealousy in God's kingdom, is there? Cain and Abel. Cain, jealous of his brother. And so sadly, so many of us look for purpose you know, outside of themselves, comparing ourselves, themselves to others, and getting disappointed. It's far better, friends, to look, to look deep within yourself at the gifts and the talents God has given you and develop those to their full potential and find your pathway as you love the way God has made you. It's deep down in your DNA, just like that Cape Fur seal. He looks okay on the ocean. He looked cute and cuddly. Mind you, I wouldn't have gone too close. But in the ocean, he's amazing. He was made for that, wasn't he? The second thing, you know, the first being the purpose of life. The, first, the second thing is, you know, this ancient system of beliefs that the Old Testament brings into the New Testament. You know, what is success in life? What does it mean to be successful? Enoch's life, Enoch's life, shows us what true success is all about. It's also in Hebrews 11. In his epitaph, in the epitaph of Enoch, there were no Olympic medals. We're a little short on those in South Africa, but we're getting there. The gold is coming. I believe that there was a second in the long jump yesterday by one centimeter, was it? I mean, how close have you got to get? 
Some people are coming, what is it, 20th, 30th, and they're breaking, you know, their national record, but they, they're not getting up in the first 20. How hard have you got to work, you know, work to get a medal? You prepare for four years, don't you? You prepare your whole life. And so in Enoch's epitaph, there are no gold, gold medals. There's no large credit balance. There's no list of business achievements. There's no academic achievements. His epitaph simply reads like this. Genesis chapter 5 starts out. When, verse 21, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with his God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Verse 23, Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. You see, these guys ate their veggies, obeyed their parents, and they lived long lives. 365. Verse 24, Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more because God took him up. That's a successful life, friends. That's living a life of purpose, the life of faith. Was that 365 years of ease? Was that 365 years of no conflict? Was that 365 years of no relational pain? How was the economy east of Eden? Well, not good. They were living under the curse of Adam and Eve, just like you and I are. Eking out a living. East of Eden, life was tough and hard, just like it is for you and I today. And yet Enoch lived a wonderfully successful life. He walked faithfully for 365 years. Can you and I do it for 365 days? I think that's what the text is saying. It's possible to walk faithfully with God. Enoch did it way back in the Old Testament. What's the great secret to living a deeply fulfilled walk of faith one day at a time, one hour at a time, enough faith for the day? In South Africa, the Cape fur seal is the only seal species that breeds here. However, other species such as the elephant seal the sub-Antarctic fur seal, the leopard seal, occasionally occur on our coastline. The bulls of the Cape fur seal get up to two and a half meters long. They weigh to 200 to 350 kilograms. The cows are much smaller, 1.2 to 1.6 meters long, about 40 to 80 kilograms. Males have a large chest and a thick mane. And the smaller females have silvery gray fur. Newborn pups, like the one I saw, are velvet black. You feel like you want to touch them. But after their first molt at three to five months of age, they change to an olive gray color. After a year, their coat turns silver gray. Cape fur seals can live up to how many years? <laughs> 21 years of age. I didn't know that. 21 years of age. Isn't that just glorious? 21 years of age. Did you know that, friends? I didn't. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. That's a life of faith. Going on to be with Jesus. Matthew 5, verse 25. Matthew 5. Therefore... Jesus is speaking. Maybe he's speaking to you and I today. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. This text will put Woolworths out of business. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? The life of faith, the glorious life of faith, one day at a time. That baby seal did not look worried to me. Mom wasn't around, dad wasn't around in sight, but he was made by God. I think he was a male, looked like a male. Living in that moment, basking in the sunlight of God's glory. Matthew goes on, so don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But here it is, friends, Matthew um, 5, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, is Jesus speaking to you and I today, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's true. Soon that baby seal will be out there swimming in Algoa Bay. Foraging for food among the dangers of fishing nets and uh, having to learn carefully among the predators like great white sharks. Hey, they're like debt collectors. Some days the westerly wind's going to howl across the bay. It's going to stir up a storm. The easterlies are going to bring those freezing cold waters, those stinging blue bottles into the bay. Don't you love them? Learning to live a life of faith in a stormy world. You see, the consequences, if you, if you don't believe that when God speaks, life happens. If you don't believe that life happens when God speaks, who's going to speak to the storm of your life? Because when I call on his name in the middle of the storm, it's not me that can still the storm, but him in Jesus' name, and he speaks peace, doesn't he? Be still. Only he can do that. When he speaks... Life happens in you and I. This glorious life of faith. Being completely convinced that God who spoke in his life into being is the same God who speaks, you know, into our storms. We've, Andre spoke and prayed about the, the miracles of the elections that we've been seeing. In 1994, we saw God's hand. In 2016, we've seen God's hand. It's a new beginning, friends, isn't it? It's a glorious new beginning. It's a new day. And so to enjoy the life of faith, full of purpose and success, you have to be very certain about your beginning and about your ending. You have to be very certain who spoke your life into being and who's going to invite you home in the end. Where you came from and where you're going to. We have an old dog in our home called Boaz. Uh, he's about 15 years old. He's nearly at the end of his road. Uh, we are nursing him at home. His breathing is shallow and quick. Uh, there are nights when it seems like he's not going to be, be with us anymore. We're singing him Jesus songs. We're telling him what a brave dog he's been, protecting our lives. He's just small, you know, like a little. Telling him he's lived courageously. Telling him he's going to be in the new heaven and the new earth, and we'll see him one day. It's okay, he can go ahead of us. Luke 12, verse 16. And he, Jesus, told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. It's like those modern day investment portfolios that are supposed to be set for the future. And so this man said to himself, I'll take life easy, I'll eat, I'll drink, and I'll be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will de be demanded of you. Then, who will, then, you will, then who will get, sorry, 
then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain. We're back in Hebrews. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks today, even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so they did not experience death. He could not, could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And here it is, friends. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith. Who will speak to your storm? Who will speak when your prayers are not answered the way you think they should be answered? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly <coughs> seek Him. Captain Dias all those, Bartholomew, all those years ago, you know, 1500s and his sailors, they planted a wooden cross in their devotion to a God um, whom they believed in, and yet they yielded to the fear of the sense of a future that they were going to sail off the end of the earth. It's an understandable kind of mistake to make. But on the other side, the cross gives us assurance about our future. The cross tells us where we come from and where we're going. And we'll close with Revelation 22, 12 to 14, where Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he or she has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Friends, from time to time, we have to ask ourselves, if Jesus came and took you home today, would you be ready? So, Father, in these quiet moments, as you speak to us through your Spirit with so much love, so much power, so much peace. Is your life a little stormy at the moment? Are you sure of your beginning in Jesus? Are you sure of where you're going in Jesus? Is Jesus wanting to make a course correction in your life today? Is he wanting to guide you and lead you in the life of faith? all are thirsty, Jesus says, come, and I will give you the gift, that free gift of the water of life. Is he readdressing those gifts and talents and abilities he's given you? Is it time to give him the honor and the glory and the wonder? For 
for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. And so friends, the gold medals, the achievements, the accolades, academic, life, work, The only thing that gets us in is a robe of righteousness. The free gift that Jesus gives because his is covered in his blood. And so he dies that we may have a clean robe. His own blood washes his one and gives us, us a clean one. And so in the quiet of our hearts, we respond to his great love knowing that he's got our past covered and the future in God and Jesus is looking good. So in your heart, friends, just make right with the Holy God. Hear his words of love and affirmation. Just drawing, drawing you close to himself. 